Welcome to the Need to Know podcast from the Wilson Center, a podcast for policymakers available to everyone. Always informative, nonpartisan, and relevant, we go beyond the headlines to understand the trend lines in foreign policy. Welcome back to another episode of Need to Know. I'm your host, John Molesky. Need to Know is a podcast produced by the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The center is congressionally chartered, scholarship driven, and fiercely nonpartisan. And Need to Know is a podcast for policymakers available to everyone. My guest this week is Dr. Rebecca Pincus, director of the Wilson Center's Polar Institute. She joins us to provide an update on the trilateral collaboration created by the United States, Canada, and Finland, commonly referred to as the Ice Pact. In July, the three countries announced their intention to build polar icebreakers and other Arctic and polar capabilities. A White House press release at the time said the collaboration is intended to strengthen the shipbuilding industry and industrial capacity of each nation and build closer security and economic ties. Rebecca, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, John. So uh, let me ask you to begin by providing some context for the partnership. What were the specific needs that are being addressed through this this three-way team-up? Sure. Well, the specific need is really on the U.S. side, because our icebreaker fleet is at its weakest point, um, perhaps ever, certainly since uh, the middle of last century. Uh, The United States currently has two polar icebreakers, the Polar Star and the Healy. The Polar Star was built in the 1970s, and the Healy was built in the 1990s. And so they are both old. Uh, You know, I don't want to sound ageist, but the Polar Star is past its natural lifespan and the Healy is sort of naturally, is is rapidly approaching the end of its, its, uh, you know, planned operational period. And they are both um, experiencing regular mechanical and operational challenges. And so they spend the time that they are not on mission in dry dock, getting um, you know extensive refits and repairs, and it's a really challenging tempo. Uh, keeping ships of that age running in the incredibly harsh conditions that they operate in is a remarkable feat. The U.S. Coast Guard, which operates our polar icebreakers, goes to amazing lengths to keep these ships running and and succeeding. Um, but the fact that there's just two of them and that they are that they are on thin ice, to use a polar metaphor, um, I think puts us in an incredibly vulnerable position. The U.S. is used to having a larger fleet of polar icebreakers. The U.S. Coast Guard has said that it needs um, many more, a dozen more icebreakers to fulfill its mission requirements in the Arctic and Antarctica. And so the fact that we're so um, so low is really the focus of this ice pact agreement, because Canada and Finland are world leaders in building icebreakers. And so we're hoping that by teaming up, the U.S.'s position can be improved rapidly. Yeah, that literally and figuratively on thin ice, right, with the with the melting that's going on in the region. You know, you know, if I were an icebreaker, I would take some of your comments uh, uh, very personally as far as the age of the fleet. <laughs> Why did we let this happen? Why did we allow these two aging icebreakers to be the only capacity we have? It is, um, you know, it's a classic case study in bureaucratic politics. Everyone has seen this coming, um, and it has been a football between the Coast Guard and Congress and the White House for decades. Um, you know, the Coast Guard has been talking about recapitalizing the polar icebreakers, you know, since the 1990s, the 2000s, but it has been a real challenge. Part of the problem, there's a couple different parts of the problem. Um, Polar icebreakers, the first in class, right? The first ship that you build in a class is the most expensive, and then the costs go down as you buy more and more of the same thing. But the first one is generally about a billion dollars. And the Coast Guard budget is about 12 billion. And so you're talking about a huge percentage of the budget. It is not, um, the cost of icebreakers does not fit anywhere close into current Coast Guard budgets. And so you require really enormous plus ups to be able to uh, pay for a program of polar icebreaker construction. And those kinds of really significant budget plus ups have not been feasible um, in quite a while, really. The Healy was built um, through a pretty remarkable arrangement 
orchestrated by the late Senator Ted Stevens, who was able to get it built using the Navy shipbuilding budget and then transferred over to the Coast Guard. So that shows that even in the 1990s, there were some sort of um, creative arrangements being worked out given the constraints on the Coast Guard budget. Another part of the problem is that the Coast Guard has been part of the Department of Homeland Security since 2003. Prior to that, it was in the Department of Transportation, and prior to that, it was in the Department of Congress. So the Coast Guard has been kind of shuffled around administratively for quite a while, and it's got a really big and broad mission set. The Coast Guard has 11 statutory missions, one of which is, is the icebreaking program, and that makes it sort of a tough fit in these different departments. When you think about DHS and DHS priorities, Polar ice breaking seems very far away from sort of the top order uh, DHS priorities. And so I think in terms of sort of advocating for those big budget plus ups and all the political capital that entails, I think that's been pretty challenging. Um, and it, really interestingly, the Coast Guard has no political appointees. It's all, um, you know, military and, and career, uh, career people. And so I think there isn't really that direct connection between the Coast Guard and the administration that you would get with a political appointee. So I think if you if you think about sort of all of those structural challenges, it becomes a little bit clearer why this acquisition program has been such a challenge for, you know, 20 years. But the problem is that over time, over that 20 years, the U.S. shipbuilding capacity and the really um, unique expertise required to build icebreakers has atrophied. So the longer you wait to do this, sort of the harder it gets, right? Like many things in life. Um, and so we're at a point now where we don't, we have very, very few welders in this country that can bend two inch steel, which is what you need to do for polar icebreaker. You know, and, and that's just sort of one example of the really specialized skills that you need. Those have largely disappeared in this country. And again, this is part of the reason that we're looking to, to Canada and Finland to help us regain some of that skill set. So, uh, Becca, how, how much of this, uh, the final breakthrough on this inertia, has to do with Russia and China? It's huge. You know, it's drawn so much attention to the Arctic region. And, you know, it's the Arctic has gone from being sort of a very quiet backwater that wasn't getting a lot of attention to now really ev being on everyone's radar. I think that has really helped a lot. The fact that Russia has a really big icebreaker fleet and increasingly China has, you know, more icebreakers than the United States. I think that's something that has caught a lot of people's attention. And Russia and China are, I think, um, exploiting this weak spot in the U.S. So we see China sending research icebreakers up to the Arctic every year, sending multiple research icebreakers, you know, really kind of demonstrating you know, their strength in this area. I think they're doing it because the U.S. is weak in that area, but at the same time, that has the effect of driving attention, driving, you know, a sense of we've got to do something about this. And so I think that's really helpful because that extra attention and, um, you know, sort of raising this up on the policy agenda, I think help, helps open the doors to some of these creative solutions. And, and does Russia have the largest fleet of icebreakers? They do. They have, a, they have the largest fleet of icebreakers in the world. It's important to note that Russia, the Russian icebreakers are primarily, the, the majority of Russian icebreakers are um, operated by Rosatomflot and used to keep commercial navigation open on the Northern Sea Route, which is a shipping lane across Russia's Northern coastline. So they are primarily with a commercial mission. Um, so it's not really a, a direct comparison between that fleet and the U.S. Coast Guard because the Coast Guard mission is very, very different. Um, but yes, net net, Russia has the va the biggest uh, number of icebreakers in the world. And, and you mentioned that uh, America's skills and know-how in this area of shipbuilding have atrophied, uh, would, which would explain Finland's inclusion into the triumvirate. What, what what do each of the three nations bring to this partnership? What are their relative strengths? You know, Finland has been um, the world leader in icebreaker design and construction for many years. It's got a tremendous concentration of some of the most advanced, um, you know, design and, and engineering uh, firms for icebreaker operations in the world. You know, the Acker Arctic Design Company, has, you know, designs most of the world's icebreakers. Um, they've come up with some really unique and innovative designs. Um, 
Some of the, the azipods that are built uh, in Finland are amazing. They enable these, these vessels to drive backwards and forwards and sideways and do all kinds of you know, remarkable maneuvers. Um, so Finland's long had that expertise and all kind of the spin-off industries that come along with it. Um, and again, that's on both sort of design and engineering sides. They also build a lot of icebreakers in Finland. Um, on the Canadian side, Canada has two big shipyards that um, are relevant to this discussion, which are C-SPAN out in Vancouver and Davie in Montreal, or in Quebec. Um, C-SPAN is building icebreakers right now for the Canadians, uh, and Davie uh, recently purchased the Helsinki shipyard in Finland. And so those two, I think, are both really interesting, both in terms of capacity, um, but also the U.S.-Canada relationship is unique from a sort of trade and regulatory perspective. And so I think there are some opportunities available in the U.S.-Canada bilateral relationship that are probably a little bit more flexible than you would get um, going over to Europe. And, and Becca, where do we stand on the, the from announcement to actual implementation? Where where is the whole process? I know that there was a need to create this joint memorandum of understanding that would lay out the sort of uh, framework for this. Has that happened yet? Um, it is not publicly released yet. My understanding is that the MOU has almost been finalized. That we are expecting a signing ceremony fairly soon. There's a lot of enthusiasm, um, and obviously, I think the administration is keen to get this wrapped up uh, before the end of the year. And and what would be the first uh, order of business? I know that there are three initial components, this enhanced information exchange, collaboration on workforce development, and invitation of uh, allies and partners to actually purchase icebreakers from the shipyards of the three countries. What, where Where's the first action? Where does it take place? You know, I think it'll be really interesting to see the MOU and to see what sort of the specifics that come out on that piece of paper. Um, but it will be, I think, very important also for there to be engagement with Congress um, because the ICE Pact itself, you know, an agreement between countries can generate enthusiasm and it can shape priorities. But in terms of changing the business environment, in, ter in terms of getting these companies to make decisions that would be different from a prior context, you know, you'd be looking to Congress to either appropriate funds or change regulatory um, structures. And so I think that's going to be a really important piece of this. You know, the enthusiasm and prioritization will probably generate some types of activity. Um, but obviously, you know, there is a, a free business environment right now. And so U.S., Finnish and Canadian companies have the ability in our current context to partner up in various ways. Um, and so figuring out what sort of where the rubber meets the road and how this agreement is going to change that business context in ways that will produce meaningful outcomes, I think will be really interesting. And that'll probably that road will probably run through Congress. You know, the executive branch has the ability to make some changes uh, unilaterally. And so it'll be interesting to see if the MOU is accompanied by um, some executive actions. Uh, but, you know, in the sort of big lasting pieces, given that we're headed into a new administration, a new Congress, will be those, you know, what Congress can bring to the table next year. And where and where do we look for leadership on this? You know, you earlier you were talking about sort of the diffuse nature of of focusing on these issues, whether it's where the Coast Guard lives within the federal bureaucracy, uh, the Department of Homeland Security's priorities. Uh, wh who will provide the leadership? Are there individual members of Congress? Of course, the Alaska delegation has always been prominent. Uh, where, where can we look to for leadership to keep the momentum going? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there is an Arctic caucus in Congress. Uh, obviously, the Alaska delegation is a big piece of that, but it also includes um, members from a variety of states um, around the country who recognize the importance of the Arctic. Uh, the state of Maine, um, Washington, elsewhere. So I think they're all really tracking this. I will say that in the interagency perspective, DHS has, um, I think, really uh, grown to prioritize the Arctic, um, particularly, as you mentioned, with the advent of increased focus on Russia and China in the Arctic. So I think DHS will 
um, advocate um, and, and take a leading role in this. The U.S. Coast Guard is obviously crucially involved. They're part of the DHS um, constellation. And, you know, I think private industry is going to have an important role to play here in terms of articulating what is in the realm of the possible, what are the various incentives and pressures that would produce meaningful action. Um, you know, I think it will be interesting. We've seen really bipartisan interest in the Arctic across administrations. So I think this will continue um, going forward, no matter the election outcome. Um, but it will be really interesting to see where the appetite is in Congress for direct action. There's been so much scrutiny on U.S. shipbuilding in Congress, and that's a really major sort of area of action where we've seen some, some you know, creative approaches to building more ships in the United States. If this gets successfully packaged in there, I think it could really be a game changer. Um, but to the extent to which the Coast Guard is sort of treated separately um, from the Navy, I think it'll be a really important question. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Pincus, thank you very much. Hey, Becca, before we close, uh, speaking of leadership, I want to give a shout out to your predecessor and our friend and colleague, Mike Sfrega, who a belated shout out, right? He was finally confirmed as ambassador at large to the Arctic. Yes, it's fantastic news. We couldn't be happier. And there is no one better qualified to be a, the first U.S. ambassador to the Arctic than Mike Sfrega. Yeah. OK, well, great. Thank you, Becca. And we're great to have you uh, in the chair that he started and keeping this thing moving forward. Thank Terrific. you, John. Thank Thanks. you. Our guest has been Rebecca Pincus. Uh, we hope you enjoyed hearing about the ice pack today. And if you'd like to know more about things happening in the Arctic and Antarctic, if you come to the Wilson Center website at the top of the page, you'll see a programs tab. And that's where you can find the Polar Institute and all the great work of uh, Becca and her colleagues. Uh, we'll be back with another episode of Need to Know soon. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for your time and interest.